Wild Talents, by Charles Hoyfort, Chapter 18K, Handwriting on Walls. I have several accounts, but if anybody should be interested enough to look up this phenomenon for himself, he will find the most nearly acceptable record in the case of Esther Cox, of Amherst, Nova Scotia. This case was of wide notoriety, and of it, it could be said that it was well investigated, if it can be supposed that there ever has been a case of anything that has been more than glanced at, or more than painstakingly and profoundly studied, simply to confirm somebody's theory. If I should tell of a woman who, by mental picturings, not only marked the body of her unborn infant, but transformed herself into the appearance of a tiger, or a lamp post, or became a wetter tiger, or a wer lamp post, or of a magician, who, beginning with depicting forest scenes on window glass, had learned to transform himself into a were-deer, or a were-tree, I'd tell of the kind of sorcery that used to be of somewhat common occurrence. I have a specimen. It is a Ceylon leaf insect. It is a were-leaf. The leaf insect's likeness to a leaf is too strikingly detailed to permit any explanation of accidental resemblance. There are butterflies, which, with wings closed, look so much like dried leaves that at a distance of a few feet they are indistinguishable from dried leaves. There are tree hoppers with the appearance of thorns, stick insects, cinder beetles, spiders that look like pubs of flowers. In all instances these are highly realistic portraitures, such as the writer, who described the portrait of Dean Liddell, on the church wall, would call the handiwork of a master artist. There have been so many instances of this miracle that I now have a theory that, of themselves, men never did evolve from lower animals, but that, in early and plastic times, a human being from somewhere else appeared upon this earth, and that many kinds of animals took him for a model, and rudely and grotesquely imitated his appearance, so that, today, though the gorillas of the Congo and of Chicago are only caricatures, some of the rest of us are somewhat passable imitations of human beings. The conventional explanation of the leaf insect, for instance, is that once upon a time a species of insect somewhat resembled leaves of trees, and that individuals that most closely approximated to this appearance had the best chance to survive, and that in succeeding generations, still higher approximations were still better protected from their deceived enemies. An intelligence from somewhere else, not well acquainted with human beings, or whatever we are, but knowing of the picture galleries of this earth, might, in Darwinian terms, just as logically explain the origin of those pictures, that canvases that were dubbed on, without purpose, appeared, and that the doubts that more clearly represented something recognizable were protected, and that still higher approximations had a still better chance, and that so appeared. Finally, highly realistic pictures, though the painters had been purposeless, and with no consciousness of what they were doing, which contrasts with anybody's experience with painters, who are not only conscious of what they are doing, but are likely to make everybody else conscious of what they are so conscious of. It is not merely that hands of artists have painted pictures upon canvas. It is that, upon canvas, artists have realized their imaginings. But, without hands of artists, strikingly realistic pictures and exquisite modellings have appeared. It may be that for crosses on window panes, emblems on hailstones, faces on church walls, prenatal markings, stigmata, telepathic transferences of pictures, and leaf insects we shall conceive of one expression.